great. Um, wonderful. Thanks for inviting me. It's actually a great pleasure. And um, we uh, originally thought uh, a little bit about a more technical talk uh, in the very beginning. Uh, but on the other hand, it is also um, it's definitely also related to uh, do good robotics. Um, actually, it's a major part of that presentation that I'm uh, giving today, and it's the first time that I give this presentation. So if it, if there's going to be a few hiccups or so, then uh, it's due to the fact that it's completely new to me, kind of like also a little bit of PowerPoint karaoke. Uh, I'm also using a new software, a new laser pointer, changing server parameters at the same time. It's something I always told my students not to do, but let's see how it is going to work. So. But uh, coming back to that question, what does it have to do with uh, do-good robotics? In the end, uh, and that is the, um, the, the argument that I plan to do during my presentation here, uh, it is the way we are transforming that technology right now in a service uh, for the humans and for the society. And the major parts of this slide are actually from a different um, TRI presentation, which is AI guarding the human. Um, which is basically exactly that what we are interested in, building technology that is for people. And what that actually means uh, is something I'm going to explain uh, throughout my talk. And the outline of this is, we'll briefly talk about the history, a little bit about SLAM for those who you don't know it. Um, and then I will go from there, because this is the, the hat that I changed uh, towards TRI, and talk about what we are actually doing at TRI with this technology that I uh, described before. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about technical challenges that we are facing, and uh, every OEM in this, uh, in this area is basically facing, and where we think our advantage lies in this race for uh, automated driving, plus something that's uh, gonna, gonna play a major role throughout this talk. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the data advantage that we have, and uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be done by then. So, in general, and it doesn't matter as to whether we are thinking about autonomous cars or just robots, right, we want to build uh, autonomous systems assisting us in our everyday life, and for doing this in, our, in a robust fashion, those systems need to be equipped with sensors that perceive the world, they need to have some sort of reasoning mechanisms to build models in order to figure out what the world actually looks like and what to do next, and then turn this into action and maybe modify the world. This is a very, very simplistic view of uh, that, what we actually need to do in order to build in an autonomous age. The major problem with this is uh, there is no such thing as a perfect sensor, right? and uh, also no such thing as a perfect actuator. Right? So whatever we do with a physical robot, it's not going to do what it uh, not, not going to be exactly what has been planned, and the perceptions are also things that we cannot trust entirely. Right? And this is, for example, one, one example over here, which is basically the actions that the robot would need to carry out to uh, traverse this environment, the red line. You can pre-program this, but we all know that because of errors in the, the odometers that these vehicles typically take measuring the wheel turns, um, the, the trajectory ex actually executed by the vehicle would be would look like something like this. Obviously, right? So there's actually no way of actually pre-programming that what the robot is supposed to do. Right? And uh, you now could argue, like, okay, then let's use sensors, let's take cameras or ultrasounds or lidars. And yes, you can do this. Right? And this is a typically and nicely looking ultrasound sensor for. Um, People who have worked with ultrasounds, this is a actually great uh, scan with 24 ultrasounds. A few of them obviously going through walls, the other ones ending in free space. Um, but this is good for ultrasounds uh, over the surface of the ocean. Underwater, they're way better. But uh, in the air, they're actually terrible sensors. And uh, yeah, but uh, so you could even say, okay, then let's go to more expensive sensors and uh, go from, if you want to, lidars, uh, super expensive, highly accurate. But you take, if you take a LiDAR in a dynamic environment, then all of a sudden in black is that what we actually would expect where the, all the measurements end, and you plot only those that are not maximum range, then you can see that only very, very few of these perceptions of these two LiDARs, with us 360 beams, that uh, 
measure uh, the, the, the surroundings of the, of the vehicle, of the robot, and black are the obstacles that are actually in the environment. And you can see from that that only a small fraction of the perceptions correspond to that, uh, what the environment actually looks like. And the reason for this is that this was data recorded with a museum tour guide robot, and the museum tour gu guide by nature is surrounded by people, right? Otherwise, uh, I mean, it would do its task anyhow, but uh, um, like going around and explaining stuff to the air, but uh, in principle, like uh, it is like surrounded by people, and they obstruct the measurements and uh, the view of the robot. And um, the, the the biggest hammer that you can throw at this, unless uh, you believe in the success of end-to-end -end deep learning, uh, is basically the probabilistic approach. Right? Uh, basically, taking or turning this into equations that deal with the uncertainty of sensors and the uncertainties in, uh, in actions. And um, so basically two equations. The first one is the so-called recursive base filter equation, um, which basically cal calculates the probabilistic <coughs> belief about the state of a dynamical system. And um, the second one is one equation borrowed from um, reinforcement learning or Markov decision processes. You basically calculate the, we saw this earlier today, the optimal policy for executing uh, actions. And this is two ways of capturing the, or dealing with the uncertainty that is, uh, that robots and autonomous systems are faced with. Right? And this means that perception is typically like, covered by that what is called state estimation, and action is typically that what is called utility maximization. You're basically interested in maximizing the future expected reward, and the reward is defined by some function that tells you how good it is to be in a specific state. And the key questions in this context are, what are the right representations? If you want to apply this on a real vehicle and uh, in, in the real world, then you need to have representations that are efficient. Right? If you want to apply this in a satellite or in a car that drives autonomously, then you actually need to be very, very fast when it comes to state estimation processes. And uh, you also need to be able to take good actions. And uh, that means that you actually would like to have the best action to take, which means that you need to actually maximize these over distributions, for example. And these are the key challenges, particularly in higher dimensions. Like searching a two-dimensional grid is easy, but searching a 20-dimensional grid is very, very expensive and typically not possible. So coming back to probabilistic localization, and I'm showing these slides over here because this is a technology that has been developed maybe 20 years, 25 years even ago, but it was kind of like the key enabler for that what we see nowadays in automated driving. Uh, virtually every car um, in the world uses some form of, uh, oh, so long, give me a second, of uh, that equation over here, right, um, in order to actually estimate where it is on the road. And the key idea of this is basically to maintain a probabilistic belief about uh, the state of the system, about the location of the vehicle, and uh, in the very beginning, if you assume, and this is an example with a robot living in a one-dimensional corridor, right, that uh, the vehicle is not told where it is, all the vehicle can assume is that there's some sort of a like, uniform distribution, right? The, the probability of being anywhere in that, well, here we are, uh, no, I need to go over there. So, uh, being anywhere here is actually, um, like the same for every pla every place, right? and that means that uh, robot doesn't know anything about uh, the environment. Right? The next, uh, this robot is actually equipped with a camera and that can sense um, its as to whether the robot is in front of a door or not. So it has nothing more than a, a door detector. It could be even a deep network that does this: door in front of me, walls in front of me. Right? And whenever it discovers a door, then the distribution that it uses actually looks like this one over here. So this is basically this likelihood function that's the very same as this term over here. Right? It's basically this red function. Right? So it basically gives us the likelihood that the detector says door given the robot is in a specific location. And if the sensor fires for the very first time, right, then this is exactly what you do. You take your current belief multiplied with this likelihood function. It's a constant multiplied with this likelihood function. This alpha here is a normalizer making sure that it sums up to one overall states, then it is exactly the same or proportional to that function over here. And now assume that the robot moves and you have seen that motions and actions are un uncertain, 
What you do here is basically you perform a convolution of your current belief, which is this one over here, with this function, which is a probabilistic distribution that tells you what is the probability ending up in x given I was in x prime before and executed action u. And you integrate over all potential prior states x prime over here. Which gives you that distribution down here. You can even view this as having shifted the distribution and smeared it out a little bit. No? Um, so peaks get smaller and uh, the mass gets shifted according to the motion. Right? So mean basically uncertainty increases. Right? And the next is right, when the robot passes the, the door, the second door here, that um, it again its detector fires and then you basically multiply this distribution over here with the one that our, with our current belief and it gives us this distribution down here. And, uh, the hope is that over time this distribution converges to a nice Peak where you actually can, from which you can, yeah, with high likelihood, infer where the vehicle actually is. And there are a couple of implementations of this, and one of the most popular and uh, also heavily used in, in self driving cars and, and all kinds of other domains is uh, the so called particle filter, where you basically uh, represent this, this equation over here by a, a set of hypotheses. And I'm going to skip through the algorithm. And rather show you like how this actually looks like in the very very same example that we have seen before. You basically have the very very same corridor, and in the bottom you see like hypotheses drawn randomly according to where the robot might be. And uh, it's now kind of like a survival of the fittest scheme. What we what we do is basically we um, evaluate at every point in time we get a perception, a sensor measurement or this camera tells us, or, or the network tells us, I'm in front of a door, then uh, we're going to weigh these particles or hypotheses according to that likelihood function. Uh, that's exactly this term that you see over here. Which gives us kind of like these, these weighted particles that look like towers. Uh, and some have high likelihood, others have low likelihood. Uh, what we do now is we let those hypotheses survive with the probability that is proportional to their height. And uh, once we do this, and at the same time, we can propagate them whenever we have a movement, this is typically done in parallel, then you actually shift these particles according to more or less, you basically sample through that motion model. It's a little bit more complicated process, and then you perform the survival of the fittest approach. And from that, you can see that uh, these particles move and cluster in the same way where we saw the peaks before. And this is the, the key idea. Of, of this algorithm, and this actually works very, very nicely, and uh, also like, allows localization of robots in uh, based on ultrasound sensors. Uh, here you can see how these uh, these measurements actually cluster, uh, how these, these particles or hypotheses cluster according to the different hypotheses as to where the robot might be, given all these uh, perceptions it has seen and actions carried out. And, and, uh, due to the fact that the rooms look different in the end, we end up having a unique peak. This is localization. This basically tells us the, the robot where it is. And the assumption is that this, what you see in the background, is given, namely the map. The key question is how can we actually get the map? And this is also the second advancement that we saw in robotics over the past years, uh, namely uh, in, in the area of SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. And if you want to know what that means, it is basically um, like you steer the robot around, and again, its measure, its odometry is uncertain, so it never exactly knows where it was. If you project the measurements according to this trajectory that is reported by the odometry, then uh, you get information like this over here. And um, the key problem in SLAM is now to recover the true layout of the environment and the true location of the vehicle for every point in time. And, uh, Again, you can do this in the same, very same way with uh, the particle filter, where now every hypothesis doesn't only carry the pose of the vehicle, but in addition to that, the entire map. And uh, or a hypothesis about the map, what the map would look like. And in a particle filter with three hypotheses or particles, that would mean yeah, that we have three different maps that maybe look like uh, those over here. Uh, and uh, because they have different trajectories, they, they look slightly different, and by applying the survival of the fittest scheme, we basically have the situation that uh, some maps are more consistent than others, and the more consistent maps survive, and the hope is that in the end, the robot comes up with a consistent uh, map. And um, 
This is an application example where you can actually see this filter in, uh, in, uh, in action and you can actually see how this map changes simply because from time to time, simply because these particles actually, um, or the most likely particle changes and uh, the most consistent map um, goes over to a different particle and you always plot this with the map that has the highest consistent score, meaning the likelihood of uh, the observations. Right? You can apply this to like larger and really large environments, and um, over time, people have actually also done like auto of campuses uh, to a really, really huge extent. But with this approach, it doesn't really apply to city scale uh, maps or even global scale maps that we have seen in the, in the presentation before. Maps like that one, um, and this is like the, the next innovation that has been done in, in, in SLAM. That will bring us then to the to the real application that we are looking for as being the so-called maximum likelihood estimation approaches, or that what is called graph-based slab. It's basically an optimization approach that uh, takes all the information uh, that is available, not in a filtering scheme as we have seen before, but rather phrases this question: the question, what is the map that is most consistent with all the observations that I've seen thus far? And uh, all the approaches that you find on the web are basically the very same, apart from mathematical uh, details. The, um, usually what happens is you take these, the observations that you had, meaning odometry and, uh, and your range observations, or could even be landmark observations from cameras, uh, and you convert this into a graph representation, which basically looks like this over here. Uh, so basically you plot the... Um, the, the odometry, and then you have so-called data associations between observations, basically say that this landmark, landmark is exactly the same that, uh, as this one over here, so those two poses actually need to be the very same in principle. And uh, This gives the horizontal uh, connections in the so-called post graph. Right? So after that you can throw away all the data, and mathematically this is now considered as a, an optimization problem, and which is very, very similar to throwing um, like a, a spring mass system into a bath of oil. Yeah? You take a distorted spring mass system and throw this into a bath of oil, then these springs will actually contract these masses into the minimum energy configuration. Yeah? So that is actually the most, like the lowest energy configuration that you can achieve. That's what's going to happen. The, the oil it's kind, of, it's kind of like a damping factor in there, that something that you always need to do when you do gradient descent in order to not overshoot and lose the, the, uh, the solution. Uh, so, so this is basically that what happens, and mathematically this is nothing else but gradient descent. You calculate the gradient and then uh, go a step downward in, in, the, in your cost function, with the hope to converge into the global minimum uh, with respect to the energy. Uh, and once you achieve that, you get a map like this over the a graph like this over here, and once it converges, then you can replot the map and, uh, and get like the most consistent map out of it. And this is basically the state of the art solution to SLAM that you find. And with these type of representations, plus some hierarchical modifications in order to deal with earth, earth scale maps, you can actually uh, optimize really, really huge uh, maps. Mathematically, it is nothing else but uh, uh, minimization. Uh, here's one video, I hope that it runs, uh, that shows this in action. You can do this like, uh, kind of like online while the um, robot is in action. These nowadays systems are super efficient because of the sparse structure of that, uh, of that problem. Uh, you can also go towards uh, batch optimization. You throw everything into the network, into the system, and it optimizes it, and you, you can also go wild and get lazy and ignore all the poses, and then hoping that out of that the, the system is actually able to unfold the map. Uh, systems nowadays have become uh, amazingly robust uh, with respect to this, and uh, it does not only work in 2D, it also works in 3D, and this is uh, like a, a map of the Freiburg campus, um, which uh, one of uh, like the startup uh, dot scene, uh, which I'm involved in, uh, has generated, and uh, they have commercialized this approach of um, building 3D models of 
of city uh, structures and buildings and so on and so forth. And this is basically the foundations for uh, the foundation for navigation. And every self-driving car that you see in the world uses this type of technology in different flavors. Uh, so this is basically behind self-driving cars here, the key technology. Uh, we have done additional experiments, and I want to show you at least one example, and with that I can also check the sound. Um, do a, a, in Firework, this has been a project a couple of years ago, where we asked ourselves as to whether we can build a robot that can actually navigate through city centers. And uh, it was a project called Europa, acronym for European Pedestrian Assistant. Uh, there are a few startups all over the world that do this right now, in San Francisco and other places as well. But this was one of the very first uh, projects where this technology was actually used uh, in a city navigation robot. And, uh, at the end of this project, we were supposed to have a demo like you always have to do, and um, then uh, we put the robot, at, we started the robot at, the, the, at our campus and uh, gave it a target location in the city center of Freiburg. And the only complicating factor was that on that day where we wanted to do this experiment, our press office had informed like extensively all the press like agents in the in the area so we and when we arrived in the morning there were kind of like 20 or 30 press teams uh, standing there with cameras and all kind of things and what they were doing what press teams typically do waiting for the robot to fail right? so, so this is basically that uh, what has happened so here's a video of that um, we actually made it into the uh, one of the <laughs> germany's uh, major uh, news shows which is the target team and it's tom Buro one of my most famous uh, news speakers there. Um, I always thought when I make it into that news show, I'm going to quit doing science. I'm still here. But uh, let's see, I, it's so funny, I'll let you there for a few minutes. Let's see. Galia Obelix, als Kind in German, in einem Kessel mit Zaubertrank gefallen ist, ist er wahnsinnig stark. Er bahnt sich jeden Weg, selbst eine Legion Römer kann ihn nicht aufhalten. Dabei bleibt das Schwergewicht aber etwas tollfaktig. Sein Namensvetter ist ein nur 100 Kilo schwerer Roboter, der heute in Freiburg seinen ersten Spaziergang absolvierte, ganz ohne fremde Hilfe und egal welche Hürde im Weg stand. Auf diese ersten Schritte hatten Forscher mehrerer Universitäten Obelix drei Jahre lang vorbereitet. Florian Gedin berichtet. Fast sieht das hier ja aus wie eine kleine Prozession. Und das hatte auch durchaus etwas Feierliches, diese Weltpremiere heute in Freiburg. Die Jungfern fahren dieses eigenartigen Geräts, das sich wie ein Gast aus der Zukunft und das Volk gemischt hatte. Ein Roboter, echt? Obelix heißt das Gerät, ah ja. Und was, wie man mit den Zwecke, das wird nicht wollen, dass Die war heute eine Art öffentliche Testfahrt. Es ging um die Antwort auf die Frage, ob Roboter Obelix eine belebte Innenstadt ohne Hilfe durchqueren kann. Das wollten die Forscher der Uni Freiburg herausfinden. Wir hoffen, dass er irgendwann mal tatsächlich die Städte bevölkert oder solche Roboter die Städte bevölkern, so wie wir Menschen das auch tun und dann eben halt äh, autonom Dienste ausführen, Botengänge für uns ausführen und so weiter. Vier Kilometer Teststrecke und bitteschön unfallfrei durchs Straßengewirr. Das war heute Obelix Aufgabe. Vom Stadtrand hinein ins Zentrum der Altstadt. Dabei jedes Hindernis erkennen und umfahren und die vielen kleinen Gemeinheiten der Großstadt überwinden. Drei Jahre lang hat es gedauert. Etwa sechs Millionen Euro hat es gekostet, bis der Roboter reif war für die Rundfahrt durch unseren Alltag. Doch trotz feinster Technik zeigte Obelix sich hier und da noch etwas zickig. Also er nimmt diese Mülltonne da jetzt über seine 3D-Sensoren wahr. Das wird jetzt sehr, sehr eng, wie Sie sehen. Ich bin noch ein bisschen nervös. Ne? Der Bordstein ist auch relativ nah. Ähm, warum er jetzt anhält, weiß ich nicht genau. Vielleicht ist es eben ein bisschen zu eng geworden. Wir müssen gleich mal schauen. Ähm, aber ich bin immer noch guter Hoffnung, dass es jetzt gleich noch weitergehen wird. Richtig festgefahren und reif für Fehlerdiagnose mit Neustart war der Forschungsroboter heute aber nur einmal. Sonst funktionierten die Lasersensoren, mit denen Obelix in Windeseile seine Umwelt scannt, sie berechnet und seine Bewegungen anpasst. Okay, uh, it's on the web as well, this video. It's uh, a lot of, has been a lot of fun. They know Orbit made it with two, uh, I think, with, with two interventions that we had to do. I'm happy to talk about those uh, later on. We also did some work on automated driving, and I think we were among the very first who took a car 
and uh, let it autonomously park in a parking garage, um, which is a major complicating um, task because the GPS is not going to work in concrete structures like parking garages. And this has been a collaboration with uh, Stanford, my friend Sebastian Tran, with whom, I actually, with whom we actually developed this, uh, this parking assistant uh, system where you can actually take the car and give it a target location somewhere in the parking garage and uh, the robot just goes there. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about the details how we did this uh, later on. But you've also been working on, on machine learning and that brings me basically to the, to the end of this foundational aspect where um, we have been, like, particularly over the past years, my group has been intensively, look, looked into, has intensively looked into deep learning approaches and here we're trying to use a deep network to guess as to whether the car in front of us is actually moving or not, which is super relevant for self-driving up cars. Um, so um, like blue means uh, standing and uh, green means driving. And um, that was basically one of the, the, with all this background, that was the reason why actually uh, I was uh, got an offer from TRI, which I in the end could not uh, withstand. and. Uh, um, now changing my hats and talking, and we'll talk about it, uh, about that, what I'm doing at TRI to you. Basically, what you've seen before is the technology that we're using, and we're actually trying to build this uh, for building basically uh, two systems that I'm going to explain in a few seconds. Uh, so what is TRI about? TRI has been uh, funded in, in 2016 with an enormous amount of money. I don't want to go through all these details. But uh, we are actually located in three places, Los Altos, Ann Arbor, and, and Cambridge. And uh, we are focused on automated driving and uh, robotics, and as well as advanced material design and uh, discovery. We have a couple of uh, collaboration partners uh, within the, uh, the TRI uh, landscape. The, um, the major aims, and that is why I think that fits very well to that, uh, to that symposium here, is uh, what TRI, or as being funded or started by Toyota, and as goes actually back these ideas to to, to the general spirit of uh, Toyota as a as a company that builds products for the human, um, that uh, we actually try to change the the human condition. We want to actually do something for the human, and uh, there are a couple of, uh, of needs that we have in our societies that where we actually think and we saw them this morning before but I just want to emphasize again that one of the two or three components are first of all um, safety right so actually increasing the the safety of our everyday traffic and us being uh, among cars and in cars um, providing access to people increasing mobility and then also increasing quality of life so these are basically the, um, the overall goals of, uh, that Toyota has. And uh, the first two of those, that's the ones that I'm going to talk about uh, in this talk uh, today. And the first one is safety, uh, which uh, Toyota basically regards as the guardian. And the other one is access, which is the uh, chauffeur system. And uh, if you look at that, what uh, like the, the automated driving approach um, of TRI, and this is what differentiates TRI from all other OEMs in this self-driving car business is that we are actually looking at two applications in parallel. Right? Most of these companies are actually aiming for winning the race for level four, level five automation and running after this business case of uh, we want to develop a car that uh, we can actually commercially use and make money out of. Right? Uh, the alternative is, I mean, Toyota in the end will also make money out of that what we develop. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But uh, there's a, there's an additional application that uh, is typically left out by many other companies in in this context, which is um, the so-called uh, guardian approach. Um, the first one is the chauffeur building a car, fully autonomous car that can take us from A to B. We saw discussions about this morning. <laughs> but we also saw a discussion about the acceptance of this technology from uh, the driver assistance uh, point of view. And this is what is basically called Guardian, uh, which mainly means that um, you want to build a car that uh, serves three purposes. The first one is never leave the road. The second one is 
don't hit anything, and the third one is don't get hit. And uh, which makes, which will make the Toyota car the safest car in the world. And uh, that means that we need to have like better driver assistance systems that we have than we have these days. And that means that we still need to have the ability to basically take over at every point in time and uh, prevent the, the passengers in the car and also the outside world from, from any harm. All right, and um, that is basically the one of the the, the key differentiating factors uh, that TRI has compared to all other uh, people who are in the in the very very same business. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit of that video of that um, the presentation that Gil Pratt um, gave at, at CES early this year which nicely describes what we are actually aiming for. And uh, I will let you, for a few minutes, I, I cannot do it better than him. I, I mean, in fact, uh, there's been a big machinery behind all, all this, giving a CS talk. But uh, I will leave you alone with that video for a few seconds, or minutes. <laughs> Toyota Research Institute, Gilpratt. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. And thank you to Bob Carter for that perfect lead-in to what I think you will all believe was a rather vivid and opening statement. The three-car crash that you saw actually happened just as you saw it. We know this because we were there using an array of sensors and cameras our engineers at Toyota Research Institute captured a robust and diverse set of data to recreate what happened that day last summer. Our Lexus test vehicle was traveling in the leftmost lane in manual mode. The autonomy was disabled, but the perception system was fully active. It was mapping and gathering data at the many tunnels and bridges in the Bay Area. And luckily, despite the severity of the crash, no one was injured. We show you this now not to wow you with technology, but because I want to take you through a question that we posed to ourselves that very day. So here's the question. Could a future Toyota Guardian have prevented or mitigated the crash that you just saw? We believe that the answer is yes. So let me talk to you a little bit about what Toyota Guardian is all about. The essence of Toyota Guardian is about amplifying rather than replacing human ability. It's like giving Dad his car keys back for a bit more time behind the wheel. Or even more importantly, it's about saving teenage lives where car crashes account for 30% of fatalities. It's about correcting for human mistakes and for human weaknesses and assisting the most vulnerable people at both ends of the age spectrum, where far too many lives are lost. Now, from the beginning, TRI has been committed to a two-track approach to automated driving, simultaneously developing Toyota Guardian while working on level four and level five self-driving systems that we call Toyota Chauffeur. Now, Chauffeur is the kind of self-driving technology that all of you hear about in the press all of the time. Specifically, it's an approach that replaces the human driver with AI, with a machine. Level 5 Chauffeur is defined as a system that's capable of driving anywhere, anytime, in any conditions, with no driver input. And that's a wonderful goal. Someday, we may achieve it. 
But it's really essential to not underestimate how hard a task chauffeur systems are, both technologically and also sociologically in many ways. For example, how do we train a machine about the social ballet required to navigate through an ever-changing environment, as well as, or better than, a human driver? How do we teach the systems to predict what a policeman means when they motion to you to stop at an intersection even though the light is still green? Or when a pedestrian will decide to cross the road? These are hard questions. Let's also keep in mind that it may take considerable time for society to accept the inevitable crashes, the inevitable injuries, and the inevitable fatalities that are still going to happen with chauffeur systems. Now, none of us, none of us in the automobile or IT industries are close to fully answering these questions. In the meantime, we all have a moral obligation to apply automated vehicle technology to save as many lives as possible, as soon as possible. And that's why TRI's primary focus over this last year has been to concentrate most of our effort on Toyota Guardian, employing our unique dual cockpit control system. And with Guardian, the driver is in control of the car at all times, except in those cases where the Guardian system anticipates a pending incident alerts the driver and decides to employ a corrective response in coordination with driver input. So in this way, Guardian combines and coordinates the skills and strengths of the human with those of the machine. In fact, one of the most significant advancements that we've made to Guardian this year was the creation of blended envelope control of both the human and the machine. We're inspired and informed by the way that modern fighter jets operate, where you have a pilot that flies the stick, but actually the pilot doesn't fly the plane directly. Instead, the pilot's intent is translated by a low-level flight control system to stabilize the aircraft and stay within a specific safety envelope. So, what's it feel like to have blended envelope control in a car instead of a fighter jet? <coughs> Most of the time, the driver feels 100% in control of the car. However, if the driver begins to reach the edge of a dynamically changing safety envelope, the machine begins to collaborate with the human driver, nudging the driver back into a safe corridor. The big idea that we really want to drive home today is that envelope control, blended envelope control, it's not a discrete on-off switch between either the human and the machine, but rather it's a seamless blend of both human and machine working together as teammates, and we extract the best skills from each one. Guardian also adds this extra measure of oversight to future autonomous chauffeur systems that can be provided either by Toyota or by some other company. And we think this is a key capability because as we announced here at CES last year, we plan to include Toyota Guardian as standard equipment on all Toyota e-pallet platforms that we build for the Moz or mobility as a service market. By doing so, Moz companies can use any autonomous chauffeur system that they choose with Toyota Guardian acting as a redundant check. What we talk about here is the Toyota version of belt and suspenders. We also expect that Guardian over time will build much needed trust and acceptance with the public. We call it Toyota Guardian, but actually we believe in it so much that we want to see it on every car that's on the road, not only Toyotas. In other words, Guardian for all. Now let me talk a little bit here about how we are building Guardian and how it works. One of the most important tools in the development of Guardian is simulation. Our software can be tested in a real car, forward. a row of parked cars, too quickly for any simulation okay. into the original lane to avoid the obstruction ahead. Now this growing Guardian capability gives the I-80 incident that I opened with today, that vivid crash that you saw, an interesting lemons to lemonade twist. Here was an accidental corner case on a public highway. A dangerous three-car encounter that unfolded right before our eyes. From the data that we gathered, we first developed an accurate simulation. 
which we then translated into a learning tool for Guardian to perceive, to predict, and to plan the options that it had in a split second. We then recreated that same scenario on the test track using real vehicles and a guarded, guided, excuse me, soft target dummy vehicle. In this instance, Guardian's best option was to safely accelerate away from encroaching vehicles to avoid a collision. And furthermore, by accelerating out of the way, Guardian did this other thing, which was to help make space that might have prevented the other vehicles from crashing as well. In this way, we actually created a kind of an altruistic Guardian, which we think is a really neat idea. Now next, I want to address an aspect of Guardian that makes the technology even more... So, uh, just to, like, why I showed this is basically demonstrating that by using these type of technologies, you can actually really, really decrease the number of fatalities in, in traffic, and this is why I think this is fitting the uh, do good robotics symposium here. Right? And uh, I also want to talk briefly about, and uh, we saw a lot about um, other uh, components um, these days with different types of automation, and I want to like, briefly speak about um, these corner cases and how we can actually get there. And again, I want to I want to end with that what we used to say is our advantage over other companies, which exactly lies in that in the development of uh, of Guardian. Right? So when you look at that, what um, people are telling about uh, when we will find or were telling about when we will finally uh, having uh, uh, auto autonomous cars. They are very optimistic uh, CEOs who actually think that it's going to happen next year already. Um, right, so the, um, but there are other more like conservative estimates. For example, this is one by our former colleague Edwin Olsen, who is one of my predecessors at, at TRI. And he looked at the Moore's law of uh, autonomous driving or self-driving vehicles. And you look at when you, when you look at these the standard measure that all the companies use, namely miles between disengagements, so miles that you can drive until the safety driver has to take over, and uh, then it turns out that you right now the top level companies they need approximately 16 months in order to double that ratio or double that value, uh, which means if you want to reach human level performance, it's going to take us 16 years to to get there. Right? So that if we, under the assumption that we can like uh, implement Moore's law in, in automated driving, then um, we're going to take that time. So it's going to be like it's going to be 2035 under this uh, optimistic estimation. Key, the question is uh, like how we can actually deal with all the corner cases, and uh, there are plenty. And um, Gil mentioned those in his presentation already. I have one video to show you just to tell you about one potential corner case that you might encounter, not super far from here, it is actually close to our headquarter, uh, out to, to our office in, in Nan Harbor, right? and this is how roads might look like uh, during winter, and uh, there's going to be parked fire trucks in the open, parked in the opposite direction in your very same lane, and you actually have to need to deal with all these uh, situations and people performing erratic behaviors on roads, and so on and so forth. And uh, this is one of the, the key problems that we have faced with all dealing with all these corner cases. And the key question is how we can actually do this. And um, the, our view of this is, and this is that what many uh, OEMs do these days, they basically use as a representation uh, so-called high definition or HD maps, perform localization, and then perform lane level navigation uh, for navigation. And uh, basically, the routes of the vehicle are basically implemented in the map, and that is what you see on the right-hand side. Right? Instead of this, is you, if you really want to get to level 5, or if you do have a Guardian system that doesn't have super expensive LiDAR sensors and maybe only a few vision sensors, then the only way is to actually use cheaper sensors such, such as vision and convert those, those into perceptions that you can actually use for localization and uh, inf inference about where the lane boundaries are, for example. Uh, um, in, in such a context over here. And so this is basically one of the uh, the ideas that uh, we are we are pursuing. And um, yeah, you can implement this even with different types of uh, sensors. This is here uh, a lidar vision uh, combination. We actually project semantics about what the what is in the world into the point cloud in order to make 
proper decisions as to whether, for example, this is a moving vehicle in front of us, or this is a parked vehicle, or this is a pedestrian, or vegetation. Right? So all relevant problems. Um, so, and how are we going to do this? And uh, the, in fact, what people nowadays do is uh, using all kinds of deep learning techniques for inferring these type of uh, semantic information, uh, this type of semantic information. And uh, this brings me to the, the next um, section, which is basically talking about the data advantage that, uh, that TRI has. Compared to other companies in this context who uh, build level five systems from scratch and building their own cars, um, the major difference that Toyota has is that we already have millions of cars in the road. Uh, which means that um, and many of them nowadays are actually equipped with cameras, radar systems, and many other sensors. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we actually take these type of this, this fleet of millions of cars in order to figure out like uh, what we can do. Uh, in, in, a case, in, a, in case of an emergency, how we can utilize, the key question is how can we actually utilize this information uh, in order to, um, to build robust guardians and in the end uh, level 5 cars. And, and this is a, a view graph that basically shows what is going on these days. And many, many companies are actually building on deep learning technology and trying to. Uh, increase robustness and performance of these cars by heavily relying on, on deep learning. We had a discussion over lunch that some companies are actually very, very super happy about this. However, this comes with this problem that uh, when you say data is the new oil, then this is actually right now is a situation that labeled data is the new oil. And getting labeled data is enormously expensive. Right? Single image costs, or a 3D LiDAR scan costs a few dollars, and we have seen this before, and this talk about skin, right? you need thousands of images, and for a car you need millions of images. Right? So this is extremely e expensive, like if we, you want to follow this approach for building a self-driving car and dealing with all the corner cases. In addition to that, it's hard to get all these images. Right? But, uh, and here comes the advantage that, uh, that TRI has, Namely, the fact that um, we do have um, all these cars in the, in the world. And what I want to do at the end, I want to briefly show you one example of how you can actually do this. This is one of our strategies to utilize the, the fleet of the cars in the world. Uh, this is a paper that is called uh, Mono Depth or Super Depth um, that uh, we have been uh, developing over the, uh, the past years. We're still working on this. And the idea there is because LiDARs um, are super expensive and people are promising that uh, it's one of the most important centers for self-driving cars these days, but it's extremely hard to get rid of those. Um, and uh, the, um, the, that what we're thinking about is actually a question of how can we replace LiDAR by a cheaper sensor, for example, a camera. Right? And um, the problem with cameras is that uh, it is hard to infer geometry. Right? They are good right now at providing with semantics, but it's hard to get, to get geometry. If you look at the sensor ensemble that you do have on self-driving cars, then it's typically the case that the LiDAR provides you with stuff distances. Right? The cameras provide you with semantics, and radar provides you with speeds. Right? And this is basically that, uh, how, the way they are combined in, in a nutshell. And um, the current approach to, to inferring depth from monocular images would be something like you take the raw data, you have your model, you make predictions, and then you calculate your loss by taking into account labeled data that you have. Right? You basically look at what is the prediction loss that I have given my model, and then you tweak the parameters of your model using gradient descent, typically, uh, in order to improve the predictions. Right? And when you encounter situations that you haven't seen before, you need to nail label those data, and then you like, put them into the learning and trainings and test set, and you're trying to improve these, uh, the network in that way. The problem with this is that this doesn't scale. It's simply too expensive. And um, right, so the, uh, the idea that we are having is, um, so this is the standard approach. What we are getting, what we want to get to is basically from a single monocular image, infer how far things are away, right? which would basically mean that, uh, I mean, 
that mean that we can and we can actually replace the lidar in the best case. Right? When we get perfect at this, we can humans can drive without a lidar in, on their head or in their head. Right? So there is no reason why uh, a computer shouldn't be unable to do this. We just haven't figured out how to do this, right? and we are on the way for doing this. And uh, so here's the way how to do this in a self-supervised fashion. And in this case, we are doing this based on, on a stereo camera, but there's a new version of that where we actually also can remove the second camera and train this entirely from a single camera just by taking account uh, the movements of the vehicle. And uh, so you, what you basically do is you make a prediction and um, based on what your training is or learning now is to basically make a prediction from a single images what the right-hand side images, if this is a left camera that you use for training, then you, your network basically trains what would the right-hand side camera image look like, uh, given my left-hand side camera image. Uh, and if you're good at this prediction, then you can actually uh, get stereo out of it and from that directly calculate the depth of the scene. Or by doing this implicitly, the network learns the depth of the scene for every pixel. This is basically, for this you need a proper Function and this is what uh, what they implemented here, taking into account not only occlusions but uh, but also other like photometric loss. This is the, the distance and then a depth regularization, uh, assuming constancy, and then also dealing with occlusions. Right. So this is basically it, and then it comes with uh, like um, a resolution enhancement uh, that plays an important role, but I think it's not near necessary to, to explain this or tell this here. And these are a few qualitative results. You can actually see from a single image the depth of the scene. And uh, here, and the interesting part is now when you're good enough, you can even do by inferring what this 3D structure of the world is, you can even do SLAM. Uh, that's what the right-hand side shows, the recover of trajectories based on the geometric features. And here is the uh, video showing the latest version in action. So what you see here on the top is basically the, in, the inferred depth of the scene based on the uh, camera image on the lower left. It's kind of like a, um, a vision-based LiDAR, so to say. Pretty cool. Okay, so coming to the end, um, what I wanted to show you in this talk is um, that, and this is why I actually went uh, to TRI, uh, what the underlying technology is, and um, that we are actually aiming for uh, three major goals, which are safety, access for people, and quality of life. Um, that um, Guardian is one of our key um, like technologies that we are developing to helping people in a shorter term than just by 2035 or 36. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's also a goal to make like life safer on the road. And uh, the key, no key technologies that we are working with is basically probabilistic reasoning and uh, unsupervised machine learning. We are doing supervised machine learning, in fact, also. This is basically our goal in order to leverage this and to reach this goal earlier than possible. If you want to join, talk to me. Thank you. Okay, questions? So I think there should be another mic on the other side. Start with Mitish. It's a great talk, a uh, lot of stuff, but uh, you said boost law for autonomous driving. And is it kind of, in your sense that it will take 16 years, is it a purely technological or is it social, legal, political? I, I was focused, in this talk I focused on the, on, the, on the technical aspects of that. If you only talk about technological development, as to whether this is, the society is going to accept this, <coughs> nobody knows. Uh, okay. But so I've also heard numbers like 99 points, some accuracy, whatever that means. So is there a certain number that it must be reached, just like in Moore's law of so many transistors per chip? So what, what metric or number are we looking for? I mean, it is extremely, uh, I mean, these numbers and metrics are extremely criticized. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the most popular metric that people are applying 
is the so-called miles between disengagements. Right? You basically count the number of kilometers you can drive until the safety driver has to take over, uh, which is currently assumed to be a case where uh, an accident would have happened. Right? It's not ne necessarily the case. You know, sometimes like, we also sometimes take over if things get too close to the car, also, which is not necessarily a dangerous situation which would have uh, caused an accident. But um, like, and when you then look at the performance of human drivers, this is approximately, it depends, like 100,000 miles. So every 100,000 miles, there is a severe accident. And uh, once you, like, you reach that level, uh, then you could argue that if the car is spent that by then, the car is safer than the human, an autonomous car. And then we need to make the decision as to whether we actually allow uh, humans to still drive their cars and as to whether we should like, rather only drive uh, with automated vehicles. Uh, it's the same with airplanes. I keep telling this to people. The safer thing that you can do uh, when you enter an airplane is to tell the pilot to stay not on board, but would rather leave the airplane before it starts. <laughs> and uh, yeah, likely to encounter the very same. Hi, uh, I'm John Barros from the University of Maryland, but also I am near you, at two, in the Institute of Advanced Study and also in the Radio Peace of Technology in Sweden. Very nice talk, but I have lots of questions. So I'll ask you three, and you can answer whichever one you want. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay, so first of all, we are looking at this problem here in Maryland. We call it active vision thanks to the pioneering work of one of our colleagues, Yanis Alimonos, where we try to actually get uh, a lot of information from monocular vision. But the question I have is, when you drive a car, you don't use just your vision. You use your body, you use all kinds of other stuff. And as a matter of fact, for experiments we've done in Sweden, this is essential to try to calculate uh, maneuvers you do. So you try to see whether that's a plus or minus. Second question is, we humans, when we drive, or we hear, or we see, we use something that's called dynamic attention. You don't examine the entire screen, as you saw. I'm only looking at particular instances. And there are cameras that you may know that they're called DNS. They actually evaluate the edges because of motion. And this information process is extremely fast and very accurate, and it helps Any di anything you want to do that direction. And the last question is, we believe here it is not enough to just uh, do sensing. You have to combine sensing with action. And, 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 and in that regard, what we know from the theory of mind from Cambridge is that when you drive or you do other things, one abstraction is that your brain uses two types of functions, one which is low bandwidth and fast, and one which is large bandwidth and slow. And I haven't seen any papers trying to exploit that in driving or robotics or whatever. In other words, the instance you, you saw for the car that hit each other, you only were able to figure it out afterwards, after you find out what recipe will work, right? And then if you, if you had a set of recipes that they are taxonomized against uh, data, you could very quickly, on situations which are very unexpected, instead of trying to analyze the image, go immediately to the recipe that is the best one for what you observe. So these are the three questions. Any of these three directions you could swing? Yeah, it's hard to remember the first one. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Uh, Maybe do we start with the second. Uh, I mean, I completely agree with you. Or the first one was uh, like active vision. I completely agree with you, and we are also looking into things like that. Like for example, um, like when we are able to make proper predictions about like where you need to stop in order to being able to observe the traffic light. Uh, these are actually hard questions and things that uh, the car actually needs to be able to do. Right? Even the same with like turns across uh, crosswalks. There's also this problem that you need to position your car in a way that uh, you can actually see what's going on in the crosswalk. Uh, and uh, in order to, and this is, is part of this. And then we in fact also looking at um, these uh, these event cameras right now. Okay. Um, and, um, and then uh, the last one was about uh, rep, 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 um, trying to use low bandwidth. Ah, low bandwidth. Yeah, that is uh, that's an interesting uh, so. I'm not aware of this. I would actually like to look deeper into that. There's a book out of Cambridge, and actually, it's very interesting because the examples that they give is actually the driving. So mm -hmm. I'm driving nice to home, and I'm going yeah. with my 
very slow band, slow and uh, high bandwidth process, and then somebody walks in front of me, and then immediately I, I, I have to have the recipe to actually act or wear them. I mean, this is basically something that you, I mean, the only solution for that is learning policies beforehand yeah. and maybe compressing them in a way that they, they like motion primitives or things like that, or behavior primitives. The interesting, the interesting approach we follow here in this particular aspect is to try to do what we call progressive learning. In other words, as you, as you keep yeah. driving, as you do as you are human, you, uh, if you like, increase your repertory of uh, yeah. reactions. And unfortunately, we also forget a lot of things, you know. That's good. <laughs> okay, a uh, few more questions. Only one question, please. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you spoke about deep learning used in perception at TRI, and um, I wasn't sure if that was used specifically for mapping or what aspect of perception it was used for. Um, and also, if... Sorry, but also if you could compare um, the deep learning you used for perception and the particle filter that you used in Friedberg, right? Like, what pros and cons? Like, why would you pick? Why did you pick one method over the other? Um, thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so, in fact, we're using um, basically deep learning approaches for um, semantics, right? trying to figure out what is a car. Right. Uh, what is a pedestrian? What is um, vegetation? So yeah, right. in the models, and uh, not so much for for geometry. Right. So the, this is kind of, that's what you, I showed you last is kind of like a little bit of an exploratory work that we need to do in order to actually reduce the for relevance of, of lidar uh, lidar sensors, uh, and and then uh, in it. In addition, there is there are ideas to, to replace uh, standard probabilistic reasoning by deep networks. People are doing uh, things that are called intuitive physics, um, and uh, this is why I asked this morning this question also about control, right, where you can actually. It's interesting that you can, in principle, in principle, with in principle, I mean mathematically, right, you can like, learn behaviors that we saw this morning even if it takes forever, without writing down the corresponding equations. So uh, this is kind of like the, the challenge to, uh, to robotics and the control communities that uh, these networks can actually do this uh, uh, without writing down an equation. You know, we can uh, hit a deer with a, with a rock without having... Uh, nobody knew the Newton's laws uh, before, uh, so we, we were able to do this. And uh, this, is, um, this is an interesting research topic. But, uh, I mean, we don't drive end-to-end -end, uh, with networks. And I would never do this, right? I would actually apply models in order to make inferences and don't get hit any stuff that is around that. Okay, I think we'll stop there. Now we go to a coffee break. But we'll